I'm going to do one thing that's a little out of, out, of, out of sorts, I guess. We're not going to continue with music like this. Y'all flip the lights on back there for me, please. I'm going to get my wife to come up here, Miss Anna. She just gave me a look. She didn't have a clue. Y'all know that song, Lord, Prepare Me to Be a Sanctuary. Everybody knows that song? Here's how I want to enter into the preaching time. I want that song to be our, our mindset. I want that song to be what's on our heart. Is the Lord to prepare me to be that sanctuary. And it says, pure and holy, tried and true. And it says, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sing it. We're all going to sing it together the first time around. But here's what I want to do on that second time. Miss Anna's going to lead you ladies, all right? How many ladies are in here? Y'all raise your hand. Every single one of you are going to copy and you're going to echo what I'm saying. I want to hear you ladies belt this song out, okay? I first heard this back many, many years ago when y'all probably weren't even thought of. I know y'all weren't thought of. But this, part, this song right here is going to turn around and just help lead us right into the preaching hour, all right? So y'all go ahead, get ready to sing this with us, all right? Thank you very much. All right, y'all follow along with me. Everybody sing it right here at the same time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. Listen on this one. If you know it, sing it with her. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Your and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. Ladies, y'all know it now. I want to hear you belt it out, all right? Y'all sing along, men. Let's go. It's our time right here. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Yes, come on now. Tried and true with thanksgiving. I'll be. Be behind me, Satan. We're going to sing it one more time just to make him mad. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. Y'all can be seated. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Lord, I come to you now, Lord, and I thank you for your blessings. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to lead God and direct in this time. Lord, I pray that you continue to bind every demon of hell. Lord, I pray that you bind every devil that could have a place in here, Lord, to turn around and cause a distraction. Lord, I pray, Lord, you just put a holy hush over this crowd to allow every heart and every mind to be open and receptive to your word. Lord, you've already began a mighty move in this place, Lord, but I still feel it in my soul. Hey, yes, Jesus, I feel it in my soul that there's still some here that need to get things right. Lord, I feel that there's still some here that need to just go down that right path. Lord, there's some here that just need to get their hearts right and be accepted by you, Lord, by asking for that forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you just continue to lead God and direct. Lord, I pray that you remove me 
Lord, I pray you remove self. Lord, I pray that you just hide me behind that cross. Lord, fill me with only the things that I need to say from you. Lord, I'm going to give you all the glory and honor and the praise for it, Lord, because it's from you and through you that the word that you've been given, the word that you've given to me, Lord, I pray that you just touch. Lord, I love you and I thank you, Lord. Thank you for this camp. Thank you for the ones that founded it, Lord, that have been bringing kids down here for 40 plus years. Lord, I just give them all the praise, Lord, and tell them thanks, Lord, for what they've done, Lord, through you and the power that you've given them. Lord, I just pray that you bless. Be with us now as we preach, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and take your Bibles tonight. Open them up to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter number 6. Verse number 15. Jeremiah 6, verse 15 and verse 16. Cody Hasty, I am going to take that water from you. Find your places in Jeremiah 6. Thank you, buddy. Jeremiah 6, verse 15 and verse 16. Just because I was raised this way and it's old school and I'm not going to apologize for it, Brother Darnell, we're going to stand for the reading of the Lord's Word. Out of respect to the reading of the Lord's Word, everybody stand up for me. Get the last little bit of jitters out before we really get to preaching. Jeremiah chapter 6. If you all found it, go ahead and give me an amen. 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 Jeremiah 6 verse 15 says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. I'm going to pray again. Y'all bow your heads. Let's pray again. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. Bless the reading of your word, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this evening, it's taken me a little bit of time. I've tried to sit here and, and gather my thoughts for camp, and I've been praying, you know, Lord, what would you have for me to preach this year at camp? As soon as Brother Jenny turned around and, and, and he suggested, hey, what about that thought of choose? I thought, well, okay, choose you this day who you'll serve. Well, that's the first thing that popped in my head, and I thought, okay. I thought, and a couple other thoughts popped up, and I thought, well, Lord, you're just going to have to help guide me. My mind started going every which way, and I want to say it was even that night he first said that. And I said, yep, I'm going to vote for that. Can I be the Baptist that goes ahead and puts that into motion? You know, and they were like, well, let's just take our time. Let's pray about it. I agree. Let's pray about it. The Lord still led us to go with choose. And so I was thankful for that, but then I still did not have confirmation to know what I was going to preach until about a couple weeks ago. I was like praying. I was kind of stressing it, to be honest with you. I was like, Lord, what am I going to preach on? You know, my mind was just spinning 100 mile an hour. But I started looking up a couple different quotes on choose. And if you haven't ever done that, there's a bunch of different quotes that pop up with choose in, in the description or in the search you know, category. So I got a few things right here. I, I, one of them I, I wrote down or I typed up. It says, you must make a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. All right? So obviously we got a choice out of choose, right? Uh, but then every one I got right here, I says, uh, every day each one of us are confronted with choices that somehow affect our lives in a larger way. And I got another good one. I'm going to get to that one later. I'm going to save that one for later. But here's my title. The three C's in life. And if you want to turn around and write down my points, number one, number two, and number three, they all start with the word C. So you can write a C on point one, a C on point two, and a C on point three, and we'll fill those in later. But each day, every one of us are confronted with a choice. So most of us in here, some of us in here drive. Therefore, you are confronted with a choice of, am, number one, am I going to obey the speed limit? I could call out a few that do not obey the speed limit that I can think of over here in the Ephesus uh, side of the, the group here, right? That... Do not control their speed limit, and I'll be the first to raise my hand, right? That's a choice that I make on the daily, right? How about for those of us that choose whether to listen to advice that we're given? 
All right? Now, of course, we can sit here and think, okay, well, Mr. Dusty, some of the advice that I get from my friends is not good advice. You're 100% correct. But how about those of you that get advice from your teachers or from your youth pastor or from a youth pastor that you still ignore? How about you you're sitting there and thinking, well, ah, they're just old. They don't know what they're talking about. They're too old school. That's not the way it is anymore. I'm going to give you what I think about that in this message. So number one, write down that word choices. The three C's of life. Number one, you will have choices. That is found right here in Joshua 24, verse 15, that I just quoted a little bit of a while ago. It says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I can testify on that and tell you, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I got an old school daddy that's a preacher that turned around and said, anytime those church doors are open, you're going to be there. And guess what? I had a drug problem growing up. Hold that thought. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. That's my drug problem. Y'all get that now? I had some big eyes looking at me like I was crazy. And Brother Darnell, I told him I had a drug problem. Right? Yeah, I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, missions conference, VBS. It didn't matter. Whatever it was, I was there. I was there. And you know what? A lot of times I struggled with that. I'm like, why do I got to be at church every daggone time? I didn't understand all that until I got married and had kids of my own. Yeah. Then I understand. I know now why my daddy did that. I know why he made me come because he was trying to instill in me a good choice. Make a good choice. It's a good thing to show up to the Lord's house anytime those doors are open. So that's what it says right here. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've kind of now adopted that mindset out of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It tells you to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. And it says, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. How many of us have ever made a bad decision? Raise your hand. If you didn't just raise your hand, you made a bad decision because now you're lying. All of us have made a bad decision at some point in time. Amen? Amen? Amen, right? So we know that our flesh can fail us if we listen to what our flesh wants, right? We've heard messages about that already, about our flesh will fail, and our flesh wants to enjoy that fun of that sin for a season, right? But our flesh will also lead us down the wrong path. And that's what it tells us right here that we need to trust in the Lord. Ask the Lord, hey, what path do we need to take? What path do we need to take on our careers? What path do we need to take on our boyfriends or girlfriends? What path do we need to take for what college we need to go to? What path do we need to take for potential who we're going to marry? Right? There's many different things that we can ask the Lord and trust in the Lord to guide us along the way. But that's a choice that you have to make. A choice that you need to choose. Okay, am I going to listen to what the Lord has for me? Or am I going to make my own decision to trust my flesh and go down that wrong path? So we see that we need to trust in the Lord with our choices. We can sit back and we think throughout. I had, to, I had my youth group do this on Sunday morning. I said, y'all go through and think in your head out of the Bible some different things in the Bible or some different things you know, about choices. I said, but first let me get you just to give me some examples of, of what you think about when you think of the word choose. So I got, number one, like choices. Uh, I got uh, which flavor Mountain Dew. I mean, is that, I mean, really? That's what I first they said that, and I was like, what? That was my kid that said that. But anyway, I got, you know, to, to pick or, you know, heaven or hell, uh, temptations. I got all these different things that popped into their minds that talked about choosing. Well, then I asked, okay, well, what about some, some Bible, you know, stories, some stuff where they had to choose between doing right or doing wrong. First one that was mentioned right off the bat, Adam and Eve. We all know that Adam and Eve made the wrong choice, Right? Eve went and took that fruit. She fell to that temptation. Then she took it to Adam and said, here, you eat it. All right, so they both made the wrong choice. Then we talked about Judas, where Judas made the wrong choice when he betrayed Jesus for those 30 pieces of silver. We then talked about, okay, well, what's some good ones? Give me some good things, you know, some good, some good choices that these people made. So we, we talked about, okay, well, what about, you know, when Paul was changed over to Saul, right? He, made, he had that Holy Ghost that had come down on top of him, saw that bright light. And then he got converted. Paul changed to Saul. That was a good choice when he had that conversion. He switched from killing Christians to now going out and being one of the best missionaries that we've ever seen represented in this Bible. We also talked about the three Hebrew boys. 
They told that king, it don't matter what you want us to do. We're not going to bow down to your little G-God. We're going to turn around and we're going to focus on what our God, the one that's in heaven, wants for us. We're not going to fall prey to what you want us to do. Then it was mentioned about Daniel. Daniel said, no, I'm not going to quit praying. I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to do what God wants me to do. Then we talked about some of these other things that, you know, that, that just kept popping up. Some different things, you know, we talked about a bad choice with it being the prodigal son. Over in Luke 15, you know, he turns around and he went to his father and said, hey, give me my inheritance. Can I go ahead and say, remember I told you my daddy was an old preacher, an old Baptist preacher? If I ever went to my daddy and said, give me something, I would have got a backhand. That's what I would have got. Give me, I would have got something. I would have got, got what would have happened. So, and I guarantee you, I'm going to get a text, Brother Darnell. In about five minutes, he's going to text me, got, got. Guarantee it. So, we turn around and then we think about Jonah. What did Jonah do? Jonah tried to run. He tried to run from the presence of the Lord. I'm going to go ahead and stop right there and I'm going to tell each and every one of you, you cannot run from the Lord. You cannot run from the Lord. We say, well, what do you mean? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's with our missionaries now overseas. He's with those that are all over the place. God is everywhere. You cannot outrun the presence of the Lord. You may sit there and think, well, Mr. Dusty, you're just sitting here talking about stuff out of this old book that y'all say is, you know what, it's just, it's, you know, it's just an old book. It's 2,000 some years old. Can I tell you right now, this old book right here that I'm holding in my hands, this King James Bible that I'm not ashamed of, that I'm not going to apologize for, is one that I will sit here and tell you that each and every problem that you face can be found with the answer right here in this book. Everything that you have going on can be found, and the solution is right here in this book. You say, well, what about going on, going through fiery trials? Didn't I just mention those three Hebrew boys? Didn't I just tell you? What about, you know, if I'm just having struggles and I feel like the devil's always trying to attack me? Didn't I just tell you about Daniel that sat there and got thrown into a lion's den? What do you think's going on with that? The Bible tells us that the devil walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Are you getting devoured right now? We got a God in here in this Bible that tells us how you can fight that devil, how you can get removed from those temptations, how you can get removed from that when you trust in him with all your desires and all your heart. Lean not into your own understandings. That's what this Bible tells us right here, so I'm not going to apologize for pointing you to this old book, pointing you to what this Bible has to say. Look right back here, though. I keep going back to, to Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. When it sits there and says, They were not ashamed that they had committed abomination. It says, Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. We've already had somebody come up here and preach. I can't remember exactly who it was that said that we're in a gener the generation right now the devil is after more than what we've ever seen. I'll go ahead and admit the devil is after my generation hard also. But the things that you guys have now that you're dealing with far exceeds anything that I had to deal with. Far exceeds anything I have to deal with. But I can't tell you my struggle, my situation, my problem that I have here with it is just like this verse says. And when I read this, I just went, whoa. I was like, this is talking about now. This is talking about this generation now. There's no shame in what you guys are doing wrong. You have no shame for nothing that you're doing. It just doesn't make you even blush. That's what the Bible just says. This old book, some 2,000 years old, turns around and just tells you that there's no shame. They don't even blush about it. And can we see now in this world that we're living in that they don't care about nothing? They have no morals no more. They have no rights and wrongs. Everything goes. All right, let's go ahead and just get down to the nitty-gritty. We turn around and our public schools are telling you what? Boys can be girls, girls can be boys, and if you don't want to be a girl or a boy, you can be a cat. Hello? Tell me I'm right. I know I'm right. Here, Look, I'm telling you, I told you that I was raised old school. Here's what happened back in my day in schools. Here's what happened. We didn't allow animals in the school. We'd had an old school mama that would come in there, that was our teacher, and she'd take that broom and she'd be beating that thing out the door. Maybe that's what we need to get back to. If you think you're a cat, you need to go back outside, right? I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, step on no toes, but I mean, the Bible sits there and tells us that you weren't even ashamed. You don't even blush no more, right? And that's what we're having nowadays is that nobody has any problems, nobody has any issues with their sin. We just heard an excellent message on sin. And what sin does, and sin will take you away from the presence and the fellowship of your Savior if you're saved and you know Jesus as your Savior. That's what happens when we mess up and we sin. It removes that fellowship from the Savior. One of the commentators I read about on this verse where it talked about how they were, they were ashamed and, and they, couldn't even, they weren't ashamed and they couldn't even blush. The commentary I wrote or I read you know, says it like this. It says, 
There was not the least sign or appearance of shame in them. It says, when charged with the foulest crimes and threatened with the severest punishments, they were not moved by either. They neither had shame nor fear. Can I tell you the one thing that pops up in my mind when I just read that? And when I first read that commentary, I think what made me switch over right here and made me think this way, as soon as I read that, I flipped over to Fox News. Or actually, it wasn't even Fox News. It was WSB, right there, local Atlanta area. And I seen somebody on a headline, Cobb County man or whatever was charged with murder of a 15-year-old kid. And this was a 16-year-old kid that was being charged as an adult because he was this close to being 17, so he's now going to be charged. He sat there in that mug shot with a smirk on his face. With a smirk on his face for killing somebody. He wasn't ashamed. He wasn't ashamed. Nowadays, the world has everybody so blinded and so jaded, thinking that they can do whatever they want and they can do however they want to do because the devil has made you think that what you choose is not going to matter. The devil makes you think that what you choose and your choices aren't going to affect you in the long run. Can I tell you, I've already had this conversation with many over here on my side. One choice that you make right now can determine your future. Okay? I'm saying that as a, as a moving forward in your life on this earth. One choice that you make today can determine your future and your outcome in your future. You make a bad decision now, that can mess you up by the time you're my age. And somebody's always going to remember you by that one bad decision. You all understand what I'm saying? Now let's go to a future, to an eternity aspect. One choice that you make today can change your mindset for all of eternity. It can change your destination for all of eternity. This world is, is going nowhere fast. I believe it was you this morning. Somebody this morning. Whoever, look, everybody that's preached so far has touched all over my message. So if I get everybody backwards when I start talking about this, y'all bear with me. We're going to sit here and think, you know, well, what do you mean about those where that verse says, the Bible says, they shall fall among them that fall. I grew up, remember I told you I grew up listening to my daddy preaching and growing up in the church. So I grew up listening and, and singing all those old Sunday school songs. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The wise man built his house upon a rock. The rain came tumbling down, right? And then what's it say? The foolish man built his house upon the... Hey, y'all know it too. Good job, right? The foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the rains came down, the floods came up, and the house on the sand went what? Splat. Y'all can say it louder. It's okay, right? It went splat. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay... They fall among them that fall. The wise man built his house upon a rock, and it stood. Everything's fine. The rains came down for the foolish man. It went splat. They shall fall among them that fall. Here, here was going to be my example, but because it's been double red flag all week, I couldn't really give you this example. But I'm hoping all of you understand this when I say it. Right now, if you was to go out there and stand right at the edge of the water, you're going to feel that sand going out from underneath your feet, correct? Because it's constantly shifting. Am I right? Can I tell you that's how this world is? Anytime you put your trust and put your faith into this world and listen to what the world has to say, follow what the world wants you to do. You know the new cool hip thing, you know, like you guys want to just fit into the crowd, fit into the world because that's cool, right? Whether it be something you wear, uh, let's go ahead and hit the good one that all of you are probably going to love, whether it's going to be to sit there and suck on that vape because it looks cool, you know, or whatever the, thing, whatever the new cool thing is. It's whatever, it's shifting sand, the world's always constant moving. It's always constant changing, trying to suck you in, trying to make it look cool, trying to make it look good. But can I tell you one thing that doesn't never shift and one thing that doesn't ever change is the word of the Lord right here. That word of the Lord never changes. It stands firm on what it believes. It tells you what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. It's not for you to pick and choose what you want to listen to or what you want to pay attention to or what you want to obey. If it tells you that it's wrong, then honey, it's wrong. If it tells you it's right, then guess what? It's right. And if we sit there and we pay attention to what the world wants, then we're not going to pay attention to what the Bible wants this morning. We need that example of that shifting sand to remind us, hey, not to pay attention and not to focus on that because the world's just going to leave us hanging high and dry. And we're going to be like that foolish man and find ourselves going splat like it did right there. Look right here at Proverbs chapter 12. I'm going to read it to you real quick. Proverbs 12, verse number 15. says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. you got preachers and counselors pouring into you this whole week, trying to show you what, you, what, we're trying to, what we've learned through the hard ways, what we've learned through the hard times of life, what we've messed up on, we're trying to share with you so you don't go down that same path. The Bible just sat there and told us, 
Right there in verse number 12, verse number 15, I mean, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. What did we just say when we first started this out? Is that if we pay attention to our own self and our own flesh, we're not going to be doing what's right because we're not trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. We're leaning into our own understanding. And that's what it says right here, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes. But if we hearken to counsel, we are wise. Brother Darnell's probably got, him and Brother Steve probably got about the most knowledge in this room of preaching the word. And he just got up here and just preached the house down last night quick and easy and made it look like it was no big deal. That was a textbook, Brother Kevin said this, that was a textbook example of how to preach. Amen, I agree. I'm not there yet. I'm going to probably take an hour, so buckle up and hold on. I'm going to try to hurry, I promise though. So. I can't do it as quick as he can. He hit the points and was done. Right? But that's what it is. We have to pay attention to the wise counsel of what God wants to do. Getting caught up in this world and the things of the world is no different than that foolish man. It's no different than what he wants. The, the one that lost it all is no different than that prodigal that wasted it all. You say, well, man, why are you hitting on this so much? Because I've been there. I was that prodigal. If I could put myself and my name in that chapter of Luke 15... They're talking about that prodigal. It'd be me. You say, well, Mr. Dustin, you've been a preacher's kid your whole life. You know what that old saying about preacher's kids are? Yeah, that they're worst? Yeah, you're close to being right on that one. Not always been a preacher. Always been a preacher's kid, but I've not always been a preacher. I've had my share of ups and downs, right? So that's why I'm now trying to tell you and trying to help you, hey, don't go down that path that I've gone down. We see that prodigal, and like I said, he wasted it all. And that's what I'm trying to save you guys from. I'm trying to pour into you. Don't waste away your life. Don't waste away what you can get right today. Secondly, we're going to see that you will have a chance. You will have a chance. We're going to look and see what that prodigal has to say. We're going to look and see what it says right here in Luke chapter 15, and verse number 17. First part, I already told you and I already explained to you that it says that the prodigal went to his father and said, give me, give me that portion that's owed to me. But then, of course, we all know the story that he went out and he wasted all of his living, wasted all that inheritance, and he wasted it on wild living and did everything that he wanted to do in this world. But notice what it says right here, verse 17. It says, and when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and not perish with hunger. When he came to himself, we know that he wasted. He wasted what? He wasted all that he had. He wasted his inheritance. He wasted his energy. He wasted his time. For what? For what? He wasted it all for nothing. All those friends that he had, all that stuff that he got to enjoy, did he have it to show for it? Did he have anything left to say, hey, look what I got in that far country? No, he had nothing. And that's what I'm trying to explain to you this evening is that, hey, if you turn around and you stay stuck in this world, you stay living for the world, you stay doing what you want to do, it's going to come a point in time that you're going to realize when it's all done and said, everybody's left you high and dry and you're sitting there going, I got nothing to show for it. I got nothing to give, you know, say, hey, look what I've done in this world because the world is not here for you. The world is not here for none of you. The world's here for themselves. The devil is the one that controls all this mess, and he doesn't want nothing but for you to sit there and go, man, this guy is crazy. He don't want... He, the devil's sitting here thinking, don't listen to him. He's trying to put that in your head. Don't pay attention. Let any distraction, let any issue, let somebody beside me laugh, let somebody beside me snicker or talk or cough just to distract you for one second. That's why I pray, Lord, put a holy hush in this place for people to be able to hear the word that's going to be presented. Because right now I'm trying to help you, and I'm trying to explain to you that this world will leave you hanging High and dry. We see that with the prodigal. It says, I will arise. When he came to himself, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I will perish with hunger. In verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. We see that this, this young man went off into that far country, thought that he had it all under control, thought he was 10 foot tall and bulletproof, had the world by the tail. But look right there what happened. He ended up in that hog pen. Ended up down in that muck and that mire that we heard about this morning. Ended up in that pit. Couldn't find his way out. Couldn't figure out what to do. So he said, you know, I'm just going to go back to daddy. I'm just going to go back home to daddy. Daddy will help me. Maybe daddy will let me just be a servant. Maybe daddy will just let me just go back and just work for him for the rest of my existence. It will be far better than working here feeding these hogs. That's what the prodigal thought. Can I go ahead and just make this known? I know this is an old saying that's been said for a long time. Sin will take you farther. Then you want to go. 
Sin will cost you more than you want to pay, and sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. That's the same thing that we just read out there out of that prodigal. We know that if we don't pay attention to the word that's being preached, if we don't pay attention to what's being done in that calling of the Holy Ghost, we don't pay attention to that, that knocking that we're feeling on our heart, this may be the last time we'll have that chance to get things right. We're not guaranteed our tomorrows. We're not guaranteed to make it out of this week. Our life is but a vapor, the Bible tells us. It appeareth for a little time, and it vanisheth away. You can make that choice tonight to choose God. You can make that choice tonight to choose God. We talked about Jonah a while ago, and what did Jonah do? He ran from the presence, and the Bible tells us he went down, down to Joppa, went down into the ship, then he went down into that belly of the well. Sin's going to only do the same thing and take you down, down, down. Jonah got a whale. What are you going to get? What are you going to get? I'm thinking what you got right here so far is a week of camp to try to give you that, hey, I'm trying to give you that nudge. You need to get your life right. That Holy Ghost going, hey, these people are talking to you. Well, you may not get something as good as a fish to spit you back out on dry land or a chance to be at camp to get your life right. We may not be given another opportunity to figure out what the Lord's going to try to give us to, hey, to get our attention, to get our attention. We must make a choice to take a chance or our life will never change. But listen, here's another one of these quotes I told you I found. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. But here's why I want you to understand. This is kind of going to be a rhetorical question. I just want you to understand what I'm trying to say here. Do you know that Jesus has already taken all your problems? Jesus already got all your problems under control. Every issue that you may have, every burden that you may be carrying, Jesus already took those and he's took them to the cross. All of your sins that are keeping you bound up right now, he's already took those to the cross. All you got to do is come to him and ask for forgiveness. Lord, please forgive me of all those sins. Lord, ask him, ask him Lord, help me to, to get my life right. Lord, help me to get things situated to where I can experience that peace that this man's talking about. That's all we have to do tonight is just ask him. He did that by dying on the cross. He did that by dying for each and every one of you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I sit here and I ask my youth group all the time, Who is a whosoever? That is all of us. All of us are a whosoever, and that's who Jesus died for. This old sorry world thinks they have the answer for that, that peace that you're longing for. I, I, can I put it this way? All of us have a Jesus-sized hole in our heart. The world will put it out there of, Hey, do these drugs. That will fill that void. Do this do, do, drink this liquor, that'll help you. What about sleeping around with this person? That'll help you. What about doing you know, all this stuff that the world has to offer? But I'm here to tell you, that's never going to fill that void that's missing right there in your heart. The only, void that's, the only thing that's going to fill that void is Jesus, and that's through his death on that cross and his bloodshed for each and every one of you. That's what's going to happen. So look, hear me now. Here's another one of these quotes that I found. that I, whoop, It just hit me like a ton of bricks. All right, listen up. You must stop. Making C plus decisions while praying for an A plus lifestyle. You must stop making C plus decisions while praying for an A plus lifestyle. You say, man, this guy's talking about grades now. We've been out of school. I don't want to hear nothing about school. Well, I'm sorry. Stop making C plus decisions when you want an A plus lifestyle, right? We know that that's the way the grades and everything works. If we got to get a good passing grade, what do we got to do? Put forth effort. Right? We've got to put forth our effort. There must be a change. I've been saying all this just pretty much as an introduction. I've been waiting to get to point number three. I can't wait to get to point number three. Point number three, there must be a change. Number three, change. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 16. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Psalms chapter 25, verse number 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. I couldn't help but put those two together with that word path. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. In chapter 6, verse number 16, ask for the old paths. 
Lord, show me thy ways and teach me thy paths. Show me, Lord, thy ways and teach me thy paths. I don't know if y'all getting what I'm putting down, but I'm telling you here, hey, there's something in that right there. Show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy paths. And then that verse in Jeremiah says, ask for the old paths. Ask for those old paths. Brother Darnell got to talking last night. Whoop, he got into my message. Hey, I'm telling you, when he says ask for that old path, he talked about his granddaddy that used to do the things of the world, but then he got his life right. Hey, can I tell you about my granddaddy? They used to go off and do his things, but then guess what? Some old preacher come along his way and said, hey, boy, you need to get saved. And guess what happened? Holy Ghost conviction come over top of him. He fell down on that altar and got his life right. What about the other granddaddy? He turned around and got his life right. He got saved under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And then so did both of my grandmamas. I got the best grandmamas in the world. Both of them in heaven waiting on me this evening. Well, no, I'm sorry. Whoop, Grandma, I'm so sorry. Both granddaddies are in heaven. Whoo, Grandma's going to be mad now, honey. Hey, it's all right. We're going to go ahead and just shake it up a little bit. Hey, I, I'm trying to tell you, I got two good grandmamas. One of them still probably right now rocking in the rocking chair going, praying for me because she's going, Lord, he needs some help. Right? But hey, look, here's what I'm telling you. I got the two grandmamas and granddaddies that turned around and led my mama and daddy down that right path that turned around and got them saved, that turned around and got me on that right path, got me going on my way I need to go. So then now I'm leading my children with my wife down that right path. And I can stand right here and testify and say, hey, thank you, Lord Jesus, that all three of my kids are saved underneath the shed blood of Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost conviction. So now we are on that way going down that right path, down that old path. Why is it an old path? Because old paths lead to good direction. Good direction leads to that old path that leads you to the foot of the cross, up Calvary's hill, to where you can see that Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. Forty-some years ago, they come down here and set this thing up. They've been doing it for forty-something years. Why? Because they know that this leads down the good path. They know that it leads you to the foot of the cross. What about those new paths? Obviously, uh, no new paths have been shed or been coming down this way because they ain't there no more. The new paths turn around and they fall off to the side because they don't lead to where they need to lead to. That's what this world tries to turn around and tell you is, hey, go down this new path. Try this new path. Here's my example about a new path. I got a little hunting story also. My first year to Kentucky, I'm looking for this big old monster buck full of velvet right there in the first of September. I'm thinking, here we go. I'm going to shoot me a big one. We got out on this public land. We had to walk over this little old sketch bridge that was just a steel I beam about this big. 25 foot up above the water. I'm sitting there going, Lord have mercy. I can't walk and keep my balance for nothing. So I'm, it took me an hour almost, I bet, to get across this stupid bridge. So I'm getting over there and we got out there and I thought, okay, my buddy's going to go this way. I'm going to go this way. I seen this nice hardwood strip of trees. I thought, man, they're going to be coming down through that drainage ditch. I'm looking at my map. I see all this different stuff. I was like, oh yeah, they're going to be in there. So I'm going to shoot me a big one in there. I just know it. My buddy says, you might just walk up this way and then cut down in there. I said, no, I don't want to go that way because this way looks nice and smooth and it just looks even terrain. And going this way, I feel like the deer are going to be coming through this way. He's like, well, whatever you want to do. I said, it's just a little bit of privet hedge, a little bit of briars right there. I said, it ain't going to be that bad. He said, all right, well, whatever. I'm going out yonder. He said, you just have a good time. He said, text me if you get anything. I said, all right. Three hours later, I get to my daggum tree. All right, that's what it felt like at least. You say, well, what in the world happened? I'm walking through these through these briars, right? I had me a clear trail going right down this way, an old logging road, like an old, an old path. I could have walked down the old path to get to those strip of woods like my buddy said, but I was like, no, nah, I don't want to mess nothing up. So I chose the new path. Y'all getting what I'm saying so far? And how I told you it took me so long. Here's what happened. It looked nice and level. It looked like everything's situated. But did you know what happened? That terrain, that ground went down, 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 down. You say, well, what do you mean it looked level? Yeah, all them briars I told you, they were like 10 foot tall. I found myself in a maze of briars wrapped all up, twisted all over the place, and I couldn't even see where I was going. I could see nothing. I finally got so fed up, I took my bow and I just said, the heck with this, and I started slashing stuff out of the way with my bow. That's what I'm trying to shoot these deer with. You think that helped me any? No, it probably messed my bow up. You know, but I'm sitting here going, man, what in the world? So finally, when I got to where I was supposed to be going, I was like, man, Lord, this was a hassle. I was like, I should have stuck with the old path. Can I tell you right there through that example, the Lord hit me with that upstairs a while ago. That is no different than what the world's trying to tell you now. Just take that new path. It looks good. It looks nice and level. It's just a little briar thing, but it's tall. You can step over that stuff. Just keep on going. It's okay. But yet the old path's laid there just right out in the open. 
I mean, just visible for, for the naked eye. I mean, somebody that just can't even see nothing could tell that the old path's just easier walking. But then you get somebody like me going, oh, no, I'm going to take that new path. I'm going to take that way right there. That's what I'm trying to explain to you right there. That's why I told you. Even a preacher's kid that has that old life just laid out right there, that old path. Here's the easy way. Just take the old path. Take that old path. Even a preacher's kid like me finally gets to a point, and I, I, this is where I'm coming from here. Just, just hear me out. I said, man, I'm tired of going this old path. I don't need this Jesus stuff no more. Why do I need all this? I've got 20-something years of this stuff. I don't need it. I know enough. I know, all the, I, I know what to do. I know what to say. You know what happened with that? I allowed the devil to come in just keep saying, yeah, you don't need that. You don't need, you don't need this old path. You don't need to just follow what your daddy's done. You don't need to follow what your grandmama and granddaddy worked for and, and tried, to, tried to provide for your daddy and then for him to provide it to you. You don't have to do that. And you know where that found me? What does it say about this prodigal? It says that he wasted. He lost it all. Can I tell you that I turned around and found myself almost in that position too? I wasted a lot of things, and I about lost it all also. Y'all hear me? I'm giving you a life example right here to try to help you to where you're not going to go down that new path like I did, right? I about lost it all also. But here's what I'm getting at. You made me say, well, Mr. Dusty, I don't have nobody that's led me down that old path. I don't have a mama and daddy like you did that, that showed me the old path and, and everything. I, I don't have that. Can I say? I heard a very similar statement to that last night. But you want to know what I heard on behind that? Lord, I know I'm in need of a Savior. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart. And I can tell you right now, if you're along in that same boat, and you're at that same point going, I don't have nobody to lead me down that old path. I don't have nobody that showed me that. Honey, why can't you be the first mama of your family to turn around and say, hey, it's because of my mama down at Camp PCB in 2024 that they've now set my family upright. They've done started an old path. They know that old path now that's going to help lead the rest of my family to Jesus, to lead me to that foot of the cross. There is nothing wrong with taking that old path. There's nothing wrong with not having to say, hey, I apologize for being an old-time Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to apologize for nothing. We don't have to apologize for staying on that old path this evening. I'm encouraging you this evening to ask for that old path. Choose that old path. It's wrote down right here for us. That old path is right here. It's up to you to make that choice. It's up to you to make that choice. We've heard about those three Hebrew boys. They had to face that trial, that fiery trial. But what did they do? They followed that old path. They told that king, they told that king, if it be so, O king, that they would not bow, but God would save them. And they said, but if not, if, even if God didn't save them through that fiery trial and God prevented it for them, but if not, they'd be much better off than what they would be staying in this world and bowing to that king. And you know what happened? There was another one in the fire with them. There was another one that met them in the fire. Oh, the king Nebuchadnezzar turned around and said, Hey, didn't we throw three into the fire? And they said, Well, yeah. Well, why do I see four? And that fourth one appears to look like the Son of God. Jesus will meet you in that fiery trial. You say, well, you talked about Daniel also. Yeah, I did talk about Daniel. What happened with Daniel? Got thrown into that lion's den. That old king turned around and realized he'd done messed up the next morning. Went back and held, Daniel, you okay? He looked at Daniel up there just chilling. Laid back on them lions, just petting them, not even a problem. Why? Because God shut their mouth. Can I tell you, too, that God can do that for that devil that walketh about like a roaring lion? He can shut his mouth, too. He can put away all those thoughts of doubt that you're having right now if you just go to Jesus and ask Jesus to, hey, take me down that old path, Lord. Lead me to that cross. Put me up to where I can see you, Lord. But can I tell you this too? The ground is level at the cross, okay? We, we sat here and we talked about the, the, the prodigal. I truly believe, and this is just the way I interpret the scripture, the way I read it, 
it's probably wrong, but this is the way I think about it. That story of the prodigal is in there for a reason. To let you know that there ain't not one thing that you can do that will remove you out of God's eyesight to where he thinks that you're too dirty to come clean in his blood. He'll sit there and look at you and say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you've done. I just want you to come to me. Explain to me this. I, I still don't get it, Brother Kevin, how Jesus can take his red blood, take our black heart, and put the two together, and make it white as snow. We've been sitting here making jokes all week about you know mixing the two and having purpling and, and all this stuff. But you know what, that's all fun and games. But I tell you what's not fun and games is the truth and the reality of how Jesus' blood can wash that old black heart full of sin and you come out white as snow and just be clean and ready to go. That's what it's about this evening. I told you I was like that old prodigal. But here's what it comes down to. When I turned around and I went back, I made that same walk that the old prodigal walked. I went back to the Father. Went back to God the Father. And I said, Lord, my sins sure are many. Lord, my sins sure are many. I know I've done messed up. But you know what he told me? You know what he answered me? He says, where sin did abound, my grace did much more abound. That's what he told me. He said, my sin are many, Lord. He says, my grace is much more. And I felt like I couldn't get out of that pit. Brother Timothy mentioned that this morning. Isaiah 59.1, it says, Behold the land, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor the, neither is his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. You know what happened? He reached down when I couldn't reach up. I couldn't help but think about that old song. It says, When the Savior reached down for me, it says he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. Verse number one, boy, it just gets me all keyed up every time I see it. It says, once my soul went astray from that heavenly way. It says, I was wretched and vile as could be. Then my Savior in love, it gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. Can I tell you that he's going to reach down his hand for you if you ask him, Lord, I can't get out of this pit. I need you to help me up. Just like Brother Timothy preached this morning, he will reach down and lift you up out of that miry pit, set your feet on a rock and establish your goings. He'll put you on that old path. He'll set you on the path that leads straight, that leads to that, that gate. Lord, that's what it says. Straight is the way that leads into life and broad is the way that leads to, life, to, to hell. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. He'll set you on that straight and narrow way this morning. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But I tell you, the last thing I'm concerned about, well, this will close. The last part of that verse tells us that if you go on that good way, you go on that old path, that you'll find rest for your souls. But then it turns around and says, but they said, we will not walk Therein. I'm worried about those of you that may be saying that right now. Those of you that may be saying, I got time. I'm still young. I'm not worried about this stuff. I'm just here for the beach, man. You know, like this is cool. I get to see all the girls. Any boys like that? Nobody wants to testify about that? Okay, it's all right. Here's what I'm concerned though. I want to make sure that you guys are here for the right reason. Make sure that you know where your, where your eternal future will be. Where your destiny is going to be. When, we're not guaranteed our tomorrows. I had a friend that was y'all's age that just that fast her life ended. I thank the Lord that she knew our Lord and Savior. And then upon her funeral, hundreds and hundreds of people came to her funeral because she just made that much of an impact. And turned around and led to many others being saved just through her testimony. How's your testimony tonight? If you were to die today, would other people know that, hey, she was different, he was different? A bunch of people come to your funeral and get their lives right too because they saw a difference in you? They saw something different in you? I pray that if that's you tonight and you need to make things right, that you will, that you'll get things right tonight, that you'll know that you know that you know 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven. That's my prayer for you tonight. So which path are you going to choose today? I'm going to leave that open as a rhetorical question. We can start playing some music softly. I want you to think about that. What path are you going to choose today? My prayer is that you ask for that old path tonight. Ask for that old path that's been preached tonight, that you ask, Lord, lead me to that cross. Lord, lead me on the way that I need to go, Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. 
And lean not into your own understandings, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We'll go ahead and get you to stand. Every head bow and every eye closed. Here's what I want. I want you guys to every head bow, every eye closed. I don't want a bunch of moving around. This is the time where things truly and honestly get serious. This is the time where the Holy Spirit does a lot of the drawing and does a lot of the moving. I explained to mine the other night that during the invitation time, it's not time to look at your buddy. It's not time to be laughing and talking and goofing off and carrying on. It's time for everybody to get serious. You goofing off may make somebody be distracted and not get their life right. I want to make sure that everybody has that opportunity to get their lives right if the Lord's moving in their heart. I know this was done this morning, but I still feel it in my soul to do it tonight. Again, I'm asking every head bowed and every eye closed. Here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to uh, try to point you out. If that's you tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you can't want